the director of UX and design at Canada Post. And he'll also be uh, sharing his learnings and experiences on uh, cross-functional design collaboration. So let's have a big round of applause for Kevin. Really? Right. I want to thank first Preet uh, for having me here and uh, for creating such a great community. And I want to thank as well uh, Ryan and uh, all the other folks here at, at Playground for hosting us here. Uh, certainly uh, seeing them at the holiday edition back in December, and they were talking about how this studio really came into, uh, sorry, let me know if this is, uh, is, is too loud. Um, maybe we can get some friends over here to help us out. Cool. All right. And how's that hearing in the back? Can you all hear me? Cool. Uh, all right, so yeah, back in December, uh, I had a chance to, to learn about Playground and uh, hear about the journey of the studio, which was pretty cool, uh, and also about how uh, this, this space really came into, into being. And so it's pretty rad being up here and uh, seeing this, uh, this illustration here on the, on the, uh, on the pillar. It kind of reminds me of like Lee's Palace, is that, is that right? Oh, awesome, cool. So that's just a little bit of an indication of, you know, uh, maybe how old I am and, and those probably in the room have uh, enjoyed the next day too, right? So, uh, yeah, uh, I've been at Canada Post for about three months and uh, it's been a ride. Uh, a lot of learning and reflection in this period as it's often the case when you join another organization. And so when Preet reached out to me and uh, invited me to talk, it was sort of very timely because I've been kind of thinking about a lot of these kinds of things that I'm going to be talking about, and uh, it serves sort of as, a, as an opportunity for me to reflect upon my career and, and how I'm bringing that experience back into the fold and, and thinking about how it applies. So it's sort of like a natural synthesis, if you will, uh, of, of how it's all come together. So I'm looking forward to sharing this with you and having a conversation around a lot of these pieces. So the talk is uh, aligning design teams uh, in cross-functional orgs. Uh, and yeah, I thought I'd start out with, by talking about uh, org structures, uh, as exciting that, as that might be. Uh, and just to, so that I'm framing up my thinking with the folks in the room so that when I'm talking about cross-functional orgs, I think we're talking about the same thing. So I'll start with centralized teams. So centralized teams are really where organizations that have a, centra, uh, a set of designers who are sitting together uh, in a room or in a space, and they're kind of resourced out and I'm talking about in-house teams and not necessarily agencies, because oftentimes that's the case in agencies, right? Just for sake, uh, for the folks in the room, uh, who's here kind of from an in-house design and who's in-house, yeah? All right, so y'all know what I'm talking about. Uh, and agency side? And other? <laughs> nice one, cool. Um, cool. So, uh, in this sort of centralized model, you have designers who uh, are resourced to specific projects that are only for a certain amount of time. And then they come back, uh, and when that project's done, and they wait for their, their next assignment, right? Uh, in cross-functional teams, it's a little bit different. You have designers who are sitting with other designers, and I think Karen mentioned scrum teams, for example, or pods, whatever the lingo is in your organization. Uh, it's essentially you're working with other people in different disciplines. And so that's, that's really interesting and it affords a lot of, of cool collaboration. Uh, and this typically works in a very in a decentralized model where you might not have necessarily designers sitting in the same room together. Uh, they're sitting in different rooms uh, and not necessarily always talking with each other across these different teams. At Canada Post, we have uh, a similar model to that. Uh, some might call it a centralized partnership model. So we do have members of our teams who are product designers and they're sitting in, an a, in a room on agile teams or scrum teams. Uh, and uh, they are also working alongside other specialists. And these specialists might be visual design specialists or content strategists. Uh, and they're working across teams. And at Canada Post, we, have, uh, we all kind of sit together uh, and we provide room for people to kind of jam together with uh, all the other designers so that there's a really good sense of culture there. Uh, and some might be a surprise, but we actually have 12, 12 teams, 12 scrum teams that we support. Uh, and our, most people, including myself before joining, I had no idea about the size. And there were 36, uh, 36 members on the design team, uh, design and user experience. And, 
uh, and we all are focused on the customer experience or the uh, consumer experience. So we work with, uh, we work really anything that, that you might, might see or touch that is digital, whether it be mobile, the web experience, uh, and uh, other kinds of digital experiences are, are things that my team are touching. And so anything that's consumer or customer facing, uh, we're, we're working on. And certainly there's a lot of products and services that we do offer at Canada Post and it can get kind of crazy uh, with collaboration, especially a, a amongst 12 teams. And certainly I can't imagine how it might be at, with, in Karen's world at TD and speaking with some others about like hundreds of designers uh, that, that report into them. And I can't imagine what that might be. But from my experience, uh, it can be quite challenging. And so I've been spending uh, some of my time in my career around asking this question, how do you support design collaboration at this scale? And uh, I've, in previous roles, I haven't necessarily been in a director's role, but one uh, sitting on a team and, or leading a project and facing similar kinds of challenges uh, across multiple sites, uh, that, can be, that can be a challenge, right? Uh, so, you know, one might think that, oh well, you know, you just have more people and you have a bigger impact. And you know, I've come from in my experience; I, I, it's not always the case. And that, I clearly missed the mark on this one. So <laughs> <laughs> certainly not making that impact. <laughs> so uh, and certainly, you know, one of the big reasons why, and I'm sure many in this room probably have shared that sort of experience, is that because of the lack of alignment and coordination between these teams, right? And it kind of stands, when you think about agile teams or scrum teams, cross-functional teams, whatever you want to call them, uh, really the essence of them is that they're laser focused, right? They're so focused upon their goal. Uh, and even the nature of cross-functional teams is often to reduce dependencies between different teams so that you can move fast and break things, right? And so, uh, you know, sometimes that can create situations like this. And so, you know, when you look at, when you, how many people have experienced situations that are kind of like this? <laughs> like, all the time, right? So, uh, and, you know, it happens that you can't really blame the, the members of the team, and you know, it's not really, it, 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 you have to look at the incentives that are driving behaviors, right? And so when you think about that, you think about, well, the experience that, uh, the experience of really, not seeing the big picture, right? And being so focused upon your goal that you miss really obvious things. And so uh, that's one of, the, this is one of the key things that, uh, that I've experienced in my career. In addition to being uh, in large organizations, you might have designers way over here and they're working on some other problems and you're working on problems too and you're all focused upon your specific goals. And you know what happens eventually is that uh, you're, you're, you have designers who are working on things, and eventually they come out from wherever they are, and they say, "Hey, I've been working on this thing," and uh, and then somebody else says, "Hey, wait, uh, I've been working on that too." And sometimes that can look like this, and uh, the text is up here, but it says, "You know what the fuck? You guys are building a tunnel." What the fuck? You guys are building a bridge, right? So, <laughs> and I've worked at a, at a few companies uh, and almost at, at at different scales, and I've seen in my in my career that ultimately this always happens. And so, when I when when you look at these two these two things, misalignment and being unaware, it often leads to inconsistent customer experiences. And uh, it's almost mathematical. So I've been spending some time in my career, really, and especially now these days, wondering why, why that is, right? So how do larger teams and designers make it work and avoid these kinds of traps? I'd love to hear from the crowd. Thoughts? Um, you have a design director who works between uh, multiple teams and engineers to um, make sure that uh, decisions are aligned. So if someone wants to deprecate something, uh, you communicate that and get buy-in for, for decisions before implementation or, or uh, low fidelity. 
um, and someone else mentioned like component libraries to, to uh, build into something that's systematic so you can reuse uh, the component as opposed to uh, reinventing the loop. Love that, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, from our side, you know, I think oftentimes we, we, we look at the user interfaces and we think about these elements and they're certainly important, right? But I think a good place to start is, is to focus on communication, right? And when we think about designers, we often are thinking about design talent, right? And pure talent and execution. But we forget about how important communication actually is. So there's these researchers in, in M at MIT, uh, and they've been really focusing upon the difference, trying to understand uh, communication and how teams are communicating. And look, and they have this kind of hypothesis that you know, what is the difference between uh, trying to understand the difference between high-performing teams and poor-performing teams? And so they have these these uh, I don't know what they're called these badges, and they connect to these lanyards. And they've been doing this research for the past seven years with hundreds of different teams, and they collect all sorts of information about voice, tone of voice how frequently they're communicating with each other, who they're communicating with, uh, and they create these maps. And it could be a spatial map uh, of, of the location, and even other maps that kind of look like this. So they, what they found is that there actually is a, a really big delta between poor performing teams and high performing teams. Uh, and they differ in these, these key ways. Uh, the first is the amount of energy that they bring to those conversations. Are they using gestures and how exciting they sound when they're when they're speaking to each other and how frequently they're communicating to each other on these teams, right? So the more I think, Karen, you mentioned uh, I mentioned just the frequency that people need to speak to each other on your teams, and that helps. So certainly, they found that pattern as well. And the most interesting thing that I've found uh, in in learning about this is is that the most successful teams, those that are high performing, they go out and they meet other people outside of their scrum teams and they collect information. They have conversations by the water cooler or what have you. And they bring back that information to the central group and they share that information. Go figure, right? Uh, but surprisingly enough, that doesn't always happen. And teams stay very much focused on in their own groups and they don't go socialize. First, before, before I move forward, uh, does anybody, does it, how does this resonate? Is this, uh, is this something that you're seeing in your organizations? Right, cool, I see some nodding heads, cool. Uh, and you know, that, that notion of exploration is really interesting to me because uh, I, I asked myself, well, how are we modeling that communication in our organizations as design leaders? How are we looking for that when we're hiring designers? Are we just kind of going and looking at their portfolios and saying, oh, this guy's a, or this person's a, a really amazing designer. Let's bring them in. And then you just look at their portfolio and you ask them to go through a bunch of work. But you know, how are we looking at these factors when, when we're hiring? Hmm. Uh, I just wanted to say, like, when you first said that, I was like, oh, great, so the solution is more meetings. <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah. But, but it's not, right? It's about the energy and engagement. It's about productive communication. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, I think part of it is, is having these small conversations. You're like, oh, that's really interesting, and trying to connect the dots, right? Uh, and and I, I think, how do you support that that very that activity of, of going out and exploring and that cross-pollination uh, in a more formal way, so that it doesn't necessarily, you don't need to just say, hey, go out and talk to other people, because that can be kind of strange, right? So. There's a number of ways that you can create cross-pollination, I think, in organizations. One that I, I, I want to share tonight is, is really about team structures that can shift the dynamic of conversations. Because you know, when you think about collaborating with a large team, you can't get 36 people into a room and do a design critique. It just doesn't work, the numbers, right? Uh, you're going to have, if, if even when you get to a point of eight or nine people, each person is, is what, going to spend 10 minutes, five minutes explaining their designs? and what kind of feedback are they gonna get, right? So it's really important when, to think about the structure that you're creating to allow collaboration to really emerge across these teams. So I uh, apologize, uh, but when we look, there's supposed to be uh, 
numbers here. So this is a design lead. Uh, and these are different design product designers who are on these different teams, all right? Uh, so these are, these are designers who sit on different scrum teams and these are specialists that, that work within this group. And so when you, and, and you multiply that. So this is a, a similar structure that we have at, at Canada Post. And, and the notion here is that you group teams, like designers who are on different scrum teams together in rational ways, in ways that will ensure the collaboration that is happening amongst those designers is relevant to each other. Because if it's not, then they're going to start tuning out and checking their, their phones or going on Slack and messaging other people to do relevant work, right? So thinking about that, I think there's different ways that you can group these teams together these, these, under these portfolios. And, you ha and there's one way is certainly around uh, portfolio uh, or products. So for example, you might have related products together. You might group that by business, like customer segment. So personal versus business, for example, if you're a double-sided organization. You might also look at the user journey, and uh, so awareness, acquisition, conversion, and having groups together in, in that way that are focused on different missions. Whatever that, that, whatever that structure might be, I think it's important to understand what that is, and that those portfolios have a shared mission together so that when they're talking together, they can start to understand how their work impacts each other. And at Canada Post, we've also created this other structure, and this is all kind of predates me. I should actually give a big thanks to Vadim Tesla for uh, helping to bring the organization together. He actually grew it from, uh, I think, something like 10 people to over 30. It's amazing to happen in just a very short period of time. So I uh, owe a great, great debt of gratitude just to come into the organization and have these things together. So I'm sharing some of this work, and certainly uh, I uh, owe a, a debt of gratitude. So get back, getting back to communities of practice, uh, these, are, these are organizational structures that help the various discipline, the element, the people who are on these groups, uh, like a visual designer or a content strategist, for example. These are people that can connect in these communities of practice and they can share things that relate to their practice. They can, they can grow as, as visual designers. They can create new systems and processes that are relevant to them. And then they can create standards that allow those things to exist beyond those conversations. How many people are working in organizations that are structured somewhat like this? Somewhat. Do you want to share? Well, we've got we've got groups of teams which um, are working together, and mm -hmm. then those groups are working under a strategist. Um, so it's the strategist's jobs to bring that group of community together. Right. Um, and we have managers that maybe have a few of those folks there, so in my team, they're also doing reviews and helping them with their work and sharing their work and practice. practice. Um, so it's like communities of communities in a way, right. uh, because we are, we are so large. Cool. cool. Um, I think and where we could do better work is between the strategists ourselves, because then we're connecting at a much higher level for our overall visions, um, so that we're then dispensing it to our teams as well. So. Um, the different platforms we're working on are all eventually kind of heading in the same direction, somewhat. And, and how are they grouped together, these, like how are you grouping the different, I guess, groups of designers or designers that support the teams together? Lines of yeah. By lines of business? Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. and platforms, and meeting public side, um, secure site and mobile. <laughs> I'm facilitating here. Uh, so, so by, by lines of business and yes. by also platform as well. Yes. Okay, cool. And do you mind sharing how many teams do you support? Uh, like how many Scrum teams? Uh, I'm probably about nine. Nine, okay. Yeah. Just with my Within, team, but it's supplemented because as you know, it's really hard to find designers um, across <laughs> all specialties at this time. We're all looking for them. And so we actually supplement some of our pods with external agency teams as well. So I'm managing agency and internal teams and trying to bring them together. So they all are moving in the same direction as well. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Anybody else want to share their, their kind of organization if, uh, if it's kind of resembling this or even very different? Well, yeah, thanks. Uh, we have a number of scrum teams that are set up a lot like this, although we don't necessarily have specialists on the teams. But uh, yeah, I don't know, I've lost my train of thought. But basically, they're based on colors. But designers are assigned into these scrum teams. The teams are pretty development heavy, actually, 
And so um, they'll get assigned product project work based on business goals and whatnot. And then basically product owners will be brought in to uh, basically like, they'll run those teams and sit in the scrums and they're the stakeholder sits there and talks with everything. But the, the challenge with it is that we have the designers, they do sit together so that they can throw work across the portfolio teams and basically get validation of their ideas. And because sometimes the designers will feel somewhat isolated on what will be higher for performing. So the reality is they need to be able to communicate across themselves and kind of uh, yeah, get validation for what they're doing. Yeah, uh, certainly I think, you know, having designers sit, sitting together, having conversations, sharing kind of their work. Uh, how many people here uh, have Slack, uh, or use Slack in, in their work environment? Yeah, pretty much everybody, right? So, you know, certainly, you know, Slack's a great tool. Uh, it's only a tool though, right? It's really, how, how are you using that tool? How are you setting up practices around uh, sharing and collaboration that cross-pollination, right? Um, uh, and certainly in, on our team, and in other, other organizations that I've, I've worked in, we've uh, used Slack in, in a way where you might just throw something out, get immediate feedback, uh, have a channel for critiques, for example, or uh, we've had uh, kind of rituals where people share their updates on a Monday, all, this, all the different designers share updates on a Monday, and just to create visibility, right? So that if there's something that comes up that's relevant, they can just reply and say, hey, cool, I'm working on something like that too. Uh, let's solve that problem together. Or, Let's have a conversation. Uh, so uh, I'm going to continue on, and I think uh, you know that whole notion of uh, standards and design libraries and those kinds of things are so key, uh, and it helps to avoid those conversations where people are saying, "Well, should it be a, a modal window or should it be a page, uh, or you know, is this, what kind of should, is this a drop down here? Or how should we design that drop down?" Uh, and so certainly, you know, when thinking about standards in that way. Uh, I think that's really important. And in fact, at uh, Canada Post, we created a design system to help avoid a lot of those conversations that happen. And it's great to have those conversations. You need to have them. But uh, how many times do you have to have those conversations over and over again? And I think we can all agree that um, this is having a design system in place is, is really is really key to that. And uh, our design system is fully public. You can go check it out. Uh, and it's I think it's the one of the only. Uh, bilingual design system that's that's available. So, uh, so we're we're currently working on this. It's a it's a work in progress, and we're working in our organization to really build that capacity in terms of uh, a dev kit to support this. So right now, uh, where we're at is really about aligning our design system uh, as a design kit. And uh, I'd love to chat with some folks at Abstract over there in the back uh, at some point in time to to chat more about how we can really operationalize this more. Um, but it's only one standard, right? Uh, there are other standards that teams need to, to uh, align on in order to be successful collaborators, right? And so uh, things like clear roles and expectations, uh, that's so important because if people don't understand their role on a team, then they have to constantly negotiate those roles each time. Uh, and then people, or even worse, they might say, oh, well, I thought you, that was your job. Oh, well, I thought that you were going to do that. And so something gets you know, lost uh, along the way. Uh, are there, just looking at this list here uh, and being respectful of everyone's time, uh, is there any things on this that people want to talk about? I can, maybe we can start a conversation. Um, Defining done. Defining done. Yeah, you want to talk a little bit about that? About that? <laughs> I'm, I'm in a smaller team, but I used to work with agencies um, in like design pods and stuff. Um, and it was always like, there's you know, Sprint and Jira, and we do, uh, because I've always worked in their front end capacity as well. So we do join their Sprint points. But then sometimes it's like, even if with the stories, when the story is done, there's always QA, testing, reviewing, and then it's always like, we have release day, but more often than not, release day is not necessarily done. Yeah. So especially as a designer, when a dev asks me, is this done? It's like, I look through it, I'm like, I think it's done. And then they come up with all these questions, and I'm like, you're right. And then three days later, then it's done. Yeah. So it's a very, it's a constant role call. It's been like that for years. It's like all the different kinds of things it. Some are obviously defined better than others. Sure. So, sure. yeah. 
Anybody else that want to add to that? Actually, actually uh, for product company, uh, is it actually done even when it's shipped? Yeah. So even when you have shipped, at least there's always you have to then observe how the users dealing with it and does it need any tweaking? Does it need a version two to actually be helpful for the user? So when does it stop being improved? Right. Yeah. So I mean, hopefully never. I mean, yeah. You always want to continue to improve. Yeah. Right? But for for a limited resource company, okay, this was one project. How long can you be on that project before you moved on to another one? So that's that's something that we have been like talking about that as well. Right like it's always a living project and like even within the same team you can't be on five projects at the same time because you finished one six months ago but somebody needs to keep monitoring and saying that as the user needs changed right as the regulation changed that needs update a lot of these things keep coming into so definition of done is almost never done yeah exactly yeah um, we've been talking about kind of like a service level objective style language where like we agree on what the minimum viable state of the product is. Like right now I'm working on a feature where it's like we could do a lot more, but we're prioritizing just this block because this is what we need to move on. And we're building in a way that we can build on top of it, but like our definition of done is aligned in our team. Um, and we could like as designers keep making it better, keep improving on it, but um, that definition of done just has to be team one thing for us. Yeah, so I was going to say that the definition of done or that idea that it's never done is a bit of a trap, I think. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you look at what we have as uh, roadblocks or showstoppers from a development point of view, those are always very clear. It's not going out if this is broken. And we don't have that so much for UX. So one of the things that we've been trying to do is to have a kind of a UX metric that we can then say, if it doesn't meet this standard, it's not done. And so that gets a little bit to the internal agreement. And sometimes, and we have different um, standards of what we say for different features. So some of them might be lower priority features and we just, you know, there's always limited bandwidth. So we'll say, but that's going to have a design review and that'll be about it. And other ones, it's like rigorous usability testing and so forth. So having those design metrics where we can always track on what feature has met the pre-specified goal, then you can say it's done or not done. How are you done? Good. You just mentioned goals, right? And, and certainly having, uh, I think, defining defining what's done or what does done look like, uh, having bars. I think that's it's, it's a great idea. Uh, and you know, it's always going to shift, but aligning on those as a team or as an organization is going to allow everyone to under have, share that same language. And so when people are speaking across teams, they can say, "Oh, I know what you mean by done," right? Um, and then you, I think you mentioned metrics, right? So certainly that kind of brings me to my, my next point is, is uh, and arguably for me, like the most important one uh, around when you're thinking about cross-functional or between team, between, let me say that the right way, between team collaboration uh, for cross-functional teams, I think aligning on what those goals are is pretty much the definition of why you have a team is to achieve a certain goal. Uh, and so gaining clarity there is really important. Uh, in large organizations, I think it's really important to connect the work that team members are doing on their particular tasks to the larger organizational goal. And how many people in the room today can say that uh, in their organizations, that they understand that the work that's happening uh, within an individual team or a scrum team, that those things relate back up to the organizational goal? by show of hands. Oh, that's good, okay, cool. So I'm gonna have, have, have this place here. That's, that's amazing. I think that that's like a really hard place to get because so many people are just focused upon their day-to-day -day work and not necessarily understanding uh, how it connects to the whole. Uh, and so when you get there, uh, 
the point where there is this thread between the tasks up into the organization. Uh, what does that look like? And what are those goals? How are you defining it? Oftentimes I've seen organizations define goals as, or organizations or even uh, scrum teams define their goals as, well, I'm gonna ship feature X, Y, Z by quarter three. And that's the goal. And everybody says, great, we're gonna achieve that goal, we're gonna ship. And the problem with that is that having a goal defined as like shipping these features by X date um, doesn't really give designers much information to go on other than I need to make this really easy to build. <laughs> and so, you know, because, uh, and then the argument with product owners or product managers or whatever that, that function might be in the organization is really all about negotiating that uh, as opposed to the value that, it, that that feature will create. So shifting that conversation from away from let's try to just get as much done as possible to hitting the target and defining what that target is. So there's a lot of misdirected energy. And so, you know, you might, folks might have heard this, you know, outcomes over outputs. Uh, and thinking about that is, is really thinking about what will the impact of this work that this team is doing have upon the customer experience, upon the business, and framing things in terms of customer, or customer outcomes and business outcomes can help designers in understanding how to do their job better because they understand what they're trying to achieve and outcomes should also be measurable. And nowadays we have so much ability to measure uh, the customer experience uh, or the amount, of, uh, the amount of impact that this can have, the return on investment. And I, I really encourage design leaders in the room here today to start having those conversations with, with their organizations about framing framing goals in a way that are outcome oriented, impact oriented, or results driven. And I think that that can go a long way in creating common goals across an organization and uh, towards mitigating those conversations, the back and forth that often happens in organizations between designers really wanting the best possible experience, uh, but at the same time understanding that that might not be necessary to achieve what done looks like. So, um, yeah, with that, with that uh, kind of close, and these are the kinds of uh, things that I, I covered here, and uh, I'd love to learn from folks, from folks here, and have a conversation about, uh, about all of this stuff, uh, in particular about, I'm really interested uh, in how other organizations are supporting that cross-pollination. But I want to open this up. Thank you. cross-pollination because we're talking about really at the design team level but um, another way that we are trying to also do it in a large organization is from the top down and so we're creating a centralized intake process now because of course different business lines are going out and engaging vendors and all sorts of things and as you say duplicating work that's already been done um, and then it's also not being sequenced properly so we are working on the central intake team where the, the, it will be vetted first to see what uh, is your problem and, and, and going through to make sure Egypt even gets further than that. Um, and then the strategists like myself and Karen are coming in uh, where it makes sense for our platforms because as we move into Omni and cross channels, cross platforms, uh, what's not happening um, at the team level is they're not understanding act actually we also need to be thinking that this affects another team and another platform and so that's going to help actually organize which part it goes into and also that it may affect multiple parts. Yes. I think that, 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 that comment on intake is something that uh, I'm, I'm understanding myself and, and trying to ensure that when new product ideas come forward that they're coming forward uh, into the, I guess, the teams that are gonna execute on those ideas, that they're coming in with a sort of plan, some plan that is not just, we think it's gonna be this much money, and then you don't have the money when, it, when, when that project comes in, you don't have actually the, the proper resources to actually execute on that idea effectively, and so things, uh, things often get cut, and so there, there isn't that, uh, the, the, the needed learnings and the, the, the knowledge I guess like the research that would actually happen to learn from those from shipping things. 
Does that, does that feel right? Yeah, it's yeah. a lot of those things. Mm -hmm. Crazy. Uh, yeah. Am I correct, Kevin, that uh, your domain is really the uh, B2C customer facing parts of Canada Post? It's both um, B2B or B2C yeah. and B2B. So, uh, actually, the bigger part of our business is actually uh, how we work with businesses to ship products. So, it's that side as well. So, that's at the sort of small, medium business to large enterprise. So, I'm curious about the collaboration from the, the not just between the B2B and the B2C side, but there's a whole logistics and operations and delivery and postal carrier front that you know, might not have a consumer facing interface, interface at all, right. but has uh, systems that are all still pointing to the same goals. Uh, How is the cross collaboration working across those very different domains? Oh, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so I'm only three three months in, so okay. uh, and so I'm learning a lot of these things myself. Uh, I don't really have uh, a background in logistics, so it's I think that's one of the, the cool things about being uh, in the field of design is that you get to actually learn a lot about other industries, right? So, um, so uh, to kind of answer your question, uh, so our team does isn't isn't responsible for the sort of mail carrier applications that they might use while they're they're delivering packages. Uh, but we do uh, work with lines of businesses that have that, that domain knowledge. And, uh, and right now, what I'm trying to do is ensuring that, that we're creating user journeys that are shared. And so looking for looking to create shared artifacts that so that designers have different parts of that, that journey or if in the world of kind of um, service design, like different parts of that, 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 uh, that blueprint, you know, that, are, that we're trying to connect the designers who might be working because our team is responsible for what, what is that, what is the sort of front stage experience that people are having, but we're not necessarily, up to this day, connecting in a deep way with the people who are designing the backstage. And so one of the key things is, I think as, as leaders in organizations, it's really key to reach out to other people in your organization and have a place to, to bring them, to direct them. Uh, certainly, like Slack is a great place for that, uh, and it helps people to kind of come together and have conversations that may not necessarily be connected to each other. So, uh, in Canada Post, we have kind of pockets of designers who are here and there uh, that support these kind this kind of work. And so, uh, the one challenge is like solving the awareness problem of just, hey, do you? I didn't even know that you had that this was that it existed, right? And then the next part is saying. Okay, cool. Come join this thing over here because this is where everybody's hanging, you know. And uh, and I think that that's the first step. Uh, and the second step, as I mentioned, that building shared artifacts so that people understand how they're contributing to that. And once they understand that, they can. And my hypothesis is that they can then start having a conversation, saying, "Hey, let's work together," uh, and kind of going beyond that uh, the silos that happen within different parts of the business and saying. You know what? I'm just gonna go talk to, to Joe as opposed to have to, to talk to go up three layers and then over and then down three layers because that's just crazy, right? So I don't know. That's 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 my kind of like hi, my running hypothesis at three months. So uh, anyone else want to want to contribute to this one? One last question. Cool. Where? All right. Cool. Uh, cool. So I just want to like. Uh, Ask the outputs and outcomes. I think uh, they can be confusing because they're both O, but <laughs> there's a lot there. Um, and I think that those like really fundamentally change what you try to do. Uh, and as like coming from a design agency, it's really hard to do outcomes. I think because in order to do outcomes, you actually have to measure things. And in order to do outputs, you just have to check a box, which is really attractive, right? Like as a designer, like, well done. Yeah. And I want to know um, either how you go about choosing what you want to measure, or how you begin measuring things um, that are measured that sort of are what you're aiming for. Because I think you know you might end up measuring revenue, which is actually not driving the long-term value of your customer, or you might measure measure like 
views or people on the site, which as a designer is not really what you're after. So I'm, I'm really curious about how you handle those things. Yo, that's a hard one, man. <laughs> 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 um, it's a good thing for friends. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Um, so uh, I think the, the, the first one is, is certainly, um, I, I've been working in, in the world of agency for the past uh, four years or so, and uh, in, in different agencies, um, just coming from TWG, uh, and certainly this is our sort of mantra, but the, the, the biggest challenge is that as designers, how do you learn from that, right? Because you don't, you're not kind of around after you ship this thing to see did it work or not, and then let's iterate on that. Your kind of job's done, generally. Uh, unless you just want to volunteer, and uh, the folks at TWG are really nice people, uh, but you know, they're in business too. So uh, I think the other the other question to your other question around like, well, what do you measure? Like first, like how do you decide what to measure? And I think and how do you before you can answer that, you need to answer what is going to be important for us to do as a business. And I, that that to me falls somewhere outside of of I would say user experience. That's more about like business strategy, right? But that's so key because if you don't figure that one out and then you say, well, let's measure you know, revenue, but maybe that's not important, then, or let's say uh, in, in the case of, uh, in the case, let's say, of an organization, like a social, a social networking organization, for example, you work at Facebook, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And, but if, you're, if that's not, if that's not a, a, your kind of play at, at your size of your business, for example, then measuring that doesn't matter. You're actually after something different. Uh, like, for example, um, how how much how many people come to that page in order so you can generate money from a, from advertisement, for example. So, uh, I made a mistake in my own career um, when I was very eager to create the best reading experience possible, and oftentimes that means like just remove all the ads. Uh, and uh, and so I moved forward and, and did that. Uh, and then uh, it hit the business team, and they were like, damn, I'm losing all, all of money. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, I, I, learned, I learned that kind of very hard way uh, that you, know, you need to understand as a designer what the impact of what you're doing, uh, what your actions are, and that actually uh, part of that is to, to uh, make money uh, in some cases, right? But I don't know if I really answered your, that question, but. I think, I think it's 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 not just about shipping something and then that is like you check the box and success because uh, that might not actually make any impact. But I think you need to, as a business, understand like that, I think that chart. Let's go back. This might help a little bit. But thinking about you know what are these goals and what are these uh, what's the impact of that. Uh, and that's not that's outside of the realm of, of design, really. And but that should be informing what you as a as a designer who who might be here working on tasks, or you know you might be a design lead or design manager at this level, and you need to understand what those are so that when you're providing feedback and giving direction, that it's in that in light of that as opposed to what you might think. The customer might, might might want so I don't I, I'm not sure if that answered your question but we'll probably have more conversation about this man thanks thank you thank you so much <laughs> so here uh, my last kind of shameless plug uh, <laughs> uh, we uh, at Canada Post are, are always hiring growing a team uh, okay. and uh, if you're interested just reach out to me uh, you can uh, reach out to me at Canada Post uh, or on the Design X Slack group, that's my handle. And uh, of course, you can check out Mercury and our design system at that address too if you're interested. All right, cheers, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that was amazing. Uh